What an honor to be back. It's so exciting to be back at TEDS. Uh, I earned my PhD from TEDS in Theological Studies with an emphasis in Historical Theology in 2011, December 2011. And uh, for much of my PhD, uh, worked, as, uh, as Tom said, at the Henry Center, was the managing director and loved every minute of it. Two and a half years, almost three years under Doug Sweeney and uh, many friends I've seen today and uh, um, really enjoying the conference so far. It's an honor to be able to celebrate Henry at the Henry Center. I don't think we hosted an event on Henry per se while I was here, so this is fitting in many respects and I appreciated the, the previous paper, um, rich paper. So uh, I am talking about Carl Henry and Crusade University, something you may not have heard of before, but which you will emerge from this session having heard a good deal about. In Cincinnati in December 1949, the first gathering of the Evangelical Theological Society met to discuss key topics. The press release for the event promised the kind of bold effort and grand strategy that characterized scholarly neo-evangelicalism more generally. Quote, approximately 60 conservative scholars coming from every part of the country gathered at the downtown YMCA in Cincinnati on December 27 and 28, 1949, to form the Evangelical Theological Society. Fuller Theological Seminary theologian Carl Ferdinand Howard Henry was the keynote speaker of this first gathering, addressing it with a message entitled, 50 Years of American Theology and the Contemporary Need. In his message, published later in the Calvin Forum, Henry called for distinctly Christian scholarship. Quote, we must also remember that our task is a scholarly task. This is not an attempt to set scholarship over against piety. The two must ever go together. Their divorce is also one of the evils that much of modern scholarship has fostered. Genuine piety and true scholarship must ever go hand in hand. Was it not Warfield who once wrote the beautiful sentence, the systematic theologian should ever rest on the bosom of his redeemer? But my point now, Henry said, is that the task of us theologians in the proposed theological society, still going strong, of course, today in 2013, is not one of preaching, of devotional stimulation, or of cultivation of the inner life, fighting words, these I might add, but primarily a task of scholarly endeavor, end quote. The drive to re-envision the intellectual life of evangelicalism found a substantial, if ultimately frustrated, outlet in a later project by Carl F.H. Henry and others, directed at the establishment of a citadel of Christian education, an evangelical Harvard, as the phrase went and still goes. Beginning in the mid-1950s, Henry began discussing the idea with Billy Graham, the great evangelist, whose reputation had gone global in the preceding years and who had the cachet to pull off the endeavor. Over the next several decades, Henry championed this idea with Graham waxing alternately hot and cold over it. Historians in just a few places have referenced this fascinating effort, but none have addressed it at any great length. So here we will hear from a number of sources that I think will shed fresh light on the subject at hand. The drive to found a great Christian Research University began, as I said, in the mid-1950s, as so many such ventures do, behind the closed doors of power brokers. Henry and Graham shared a conversation in 1955 that shaped the discussion of the project for years to come. This was a heady time for Graham. He had catapulted to megastardom several years earlier through his Los Angeles crusade, which drew the attention in 1949 of newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst. Hearst famously directed his newsroom to Puff Graham, and evangelicalism would never be the same. Traveling all over the world, seeing thousands from all backgrounds coming to Christ, Graham discovered a new ability to found institutions from thin air. Henry wrote to Graham on October 8, 1955, after the two had apparently talked some weeks before. Though Graham may have enthusiastically endorsed the idea early on, Henry quickly surpassed him in ardor and opinions. He called for an update on Graham's thinking, 
It is time, quote, Henry said, I think for a first report on the matter of the Christian university, to which I have been giving considerable thought. Since I was pledged to confidence, I did not discuss it with Harold, but I have heard from several sources that the Boston area has a large hand in rejecting such a project. And this word has even reached the West Coast." End quote. The herald in question is none other than Harold John Ockengay, who is responsible more than any figure of the period for the founding of Fuller Theological Seminary to this point, the capstone work of the intellectually oriented neo-evangelicals. Ockengay is the most understudied figure of the new evangelicalism, quite without justification. In his day, Ockengay could move heaven and earth by his breathtaking vision and leadership ability, not to mention his fundraising connections. Today, however, he is largely forgotten, and where he is remembered, his name is inevitably mispronounced, quite nearly the most tragic of all fates given to man. <laughs> These comments aside, Ockengay had served as a trustee of Gordon College for two decades and so may have played a role, I suspect, in turning away possible schools from the Boston area. Nonetheless, a Christian university of some sort seemed a foregone conclusion in 1955. Henry saw fit at this point in the letter to propound his vision for the school. Of course, he hoped for Graham to adopt his vision and champion it. That's what's playing beneath the lines here. His letter discloses the careful attention Henry had given to conceptualizing the university. As his sketch reveals, Henry was a visionary thinker himself when it came to Christian engagement of the modern secular academy. His plans were grand and thorough. I quote at length, I want you to hear this. In two ways, the Christian university we project must differ from the presently established evangelical universities. It must in no way be projected from the standpoint of offering those who attend these colleges an opportunity to pursue graduate studies leading to the doctorate without exposing them to the secular universities. To do that would be ruinous for us, for we are thinking of rectifying and improving the status quo rather than extending it. So he's got a whole new vision. Don't miss that. Therefore, I continue, quoting Henry, they do not provide for us the pattern of what we are after. They have not in any significant way thrown themselves into the cultural crisis, but have abandoned the effective articulation of Christianity in relation to the great cultural issues, education, economics, politics, art, and even theology to the non-evangelical groups. Their passion has been evangelism, missions, and Christian education in the narrow sense, but not really Christian education in the large." End quote. Do not miss the significance of this statement. He is saying this to Billy Graham, who is, of course, from a profoundly evangelical Christian college background, president of the Northwestern Colleges earlier in his life, a product of Wheaton, as with Henry, right? And so Henry is soundly critiquing that model of Christian education. In order to accomplish these lofty goals, the school had two major needs as Henry saw it. The first dealt with curriculum and the second with faculty. So again, I will quote at length from these two points. First, the first need, to provide an institution for preparing men professionally and for the pursuit of collegiate and post-collegiate studies leading to higher degrees in an environment which so articulates evangelical Christianity in relationship to the cultural crisis in all the areas of study that we shall attract students who would otherwise be inclined to go to the big established universities such as Yale and, here's the H word, Harvard. This would be done notably, broadly, on the general collegiate base, but in a specialized way in the various schools of said university. For example, literature, philosophy, physical sciences, biological sciences, education, etc. The whole proceeding from an emphasis on the Christian concept of vocation. So that's the first need, curriculum. Second, faculty. Fundamental to the above, I quote from Henry, is a faculty composed not merely of scholars who have at one time mastered the content of their field, 
and who have managed to wrest out a respectable PhD. This is funny stuff. But of men who are working up the Christian implications for contemporary issues in their field. I do recognize that university means a company of scholars seeking unanimity of conviction in the articulation of their convictions and working earnestly together to forge a Christian alternative to the secular interpretations of our day and who are dedicated to scholarly earnestness and production, not to outside preaching, he said in parentheses, important point, restless to supply textbooks in the various spheres of study and thus productive of students who are fired by the same devotion to scholarship and research, in parentheses, the future Augustans and Anselms and Calvins, end quote, and lengthy quote. If you're going to quote Henry, you have to do lengthy quotes, don't you? The man spoke and thought in paragraphs, rich, thick, deep paragraphs. So we see here, Henry wished for the college in question to serve as a launching pad, not an endpoint for bright young Christians. He wished to attract students from none other than Harvard and to educate them with excellence in a curriculum grounded in the Christian concept of vocation, as he put it, in opposition to the traditional Bible college curriculum, which one might say was grounded in the Christian concept of salvation. I think if we're working off his thought and extending it. Of course, Henry would likely have noticed that taking top evangelical students out of elite schools would have removed leaven from the cultural dough, but he no doubt believed that the gains of such an undertaking outweighed the losses of such a prospect. Well, that was all from one letter from Henry to Graham. Graham soon responded. He mentioned various conversations with cultural leaders, all of whom indicated support of the idea. And here's Graham, quoting Graham. I have been giving a great deal of thought to the university project, Billy Graham said. America's most famous evangelical is saying this, okay? I had a long talk with Harold Ockengay and John Bolton, Ockengay's fundraiser, who I mentioned earlier without naming him. Bolton bankrolled many of Ockengay's major projects. They are extremely enthusiastic. I also talked with, get ready, Vice President Nixon, Mr. Sid Richardson, and several other prominent people, including Governor Dewey and Mr. DeWitt Wallace of Reader's Digest. They all feel that there is a definite need in this field. So there's a common spirit here. It seems also the feeling of all that I have discussed it with that this university should be definitely in the East, preferably New England. Ah, note that, New England, Graham says. Or something about an Eastern university, there's something about it that has a different prestige, it seems, than one in the West area. This may be entirely wrong, but at least it seems to be the opinion of Harold Ockengay and others. End quote. So the idea percolated. We've got this back and forth between Henry staking out this bold vision and then Graham, at this point in 1955, who likes the vision. They're both buying in, they're both at the table, so to speak. But we see that there are already slightly different visions at work here, don't we? Henry has his eye on New York City from the start, the eye of the cultural empire. Graham wonders about New England, intellectual New England, where I am from, from Maine. So I appreciate that, Billy Graham, thank you. The difference is geographically small, right? Very similar locations, very near, distance-wise, but symbolically large. To quote your realtor and mine, location, location, location. Nonetheless, conversations continued among the major players and others who professed interest. At one point in the late 1950s, for example, Henry enjoyed a correspondence with John H. Strong, son of Baptist theologian Augustus Hopkins Strong, who communicated enthusiasm for the project. Henry later relayed the exchange to Graham and noted how much Strong appreciated Graham. There was a historic dimension to this contact, Henry thought. The senior Strong had, quote, enlisted Mr. Rockefeller Sr.'s support for the idea of a Christian university while pastor 
of the Rockefeller Church in Cleveland, end quote, though neither the former and latter interests proved strong enough in the end. Several years later, in November 1959, the idea flared to life once more. A number of high-profile evangelical leaders and educators met at the Statler Hotel in Washington, D.C. on December 29, 1959. The group formerly met to discuss Crusade University. Here this term enters the historical stream, Crusade University. And it included Dr. Billy Graham, Chairman David Baker, and many evangelical luminaries, including Ockengay, J. Howard Pugh, financier of financiers among the evangelicals in this period, and Paul Harvey, the radio man who popped up in a Dodge Ram commercial earlier early this year. Great commercial, by the way, fantastic commercial. Several months before this precipitous meeting in December 1959, Graham and Henry had sent out a special booklet entitled A Time for Decision in Higher Education, colon, Billy Graham Presents Crusade University. The cover, uh, which is found in the Henry Archives and which I I'm pretty sure almost no one has seen, I presented material on this, basically this material in expanded form in my uh, in my dissertation here at TEDS, and George Marsden, Dean of Evangelical Historians, perhaps of American Religious Historians, said that he had not seen any of this material. It's just gotten buried by history. This is what happens in history, right? The cover featured Graham flashing his toothy smile, dazzling Hollywood Graham, and included an inscription from 1 Samuel 12, 23, quote, I will teach you the good way, end quote. This booklet has, as I said, never been discussed in scholarly literature, and, and yet it offers the best glimpse of any document of the vast, even unprecedented ambitions of the evangelicals who wanted to start a Christian university. It was that gold mine moment in my research. It was very exciting. The document first identifies the need for a great Christian research university. It covers demographic changes in America, and then it moves on to the spiritual crisis in the country. I'm going to quote from it. This will be my only quote from this booklet. The crisis in higher education, it said, is being studied on state and national levels, and all agree that it will take the unified effort of private and tax-supported institutions to meet the challenge. In the past, there has been a wholesome balance in the field of higher education between privately endowed institutions, and state-supported schools. Already the balance is being upset, and unless existing private schools are enlarged and additional privately endowed colleges are established in the next five years, the function of training our young people will of necessity be largely taken over by the state. So this is an interesting statement in light of Tim's presentation. And quote, the booklet played off of common evangelical fears of the day about the encroachment of the state, even as it called attention to the lack of biblical training in public institutions. <clears throat> Fueled by the vision for the school, propounded in this fascinating booklet, the first meeting of the parties interested in Crusade University in December 1959 in DC produced what so many such meetings do, committees. Little in the way of a decisive vision was reached, however. What was more, the board found that it did not agree on the matter, the dreaded matter, of campus standards or the student moral code. In light of such weighty priorities as funding, location, faculty, this subject, this reality, may seem quixotic. Yet it engaged the group like no other detail. Head over to the archives following the afternoon session and pour through them for yourself. Discussions spilled over, over this moral, moral code, moral standard, into the summer and led to a second meeting in the fall. In the meantime, attention accrued to the effort. An article by recently deceased uh, journalist John McCandless Phillips of the New York Times entitled Protestants map university here appeared in none other than the New York Times, A5 to be precise, May 5th, 1960. 
Phillips was an evangelical. Henry used his own bully pulpit in Christianity Today to make the public case for the Christian university, a subject that caused no small amount of feedback among a constituency that enjoyed, as we would expect, loyalty to many different Christian schools, all of which would be affected uh, fundraising-wise and student-wise, attendance-wise, by a major new Christian research institution. So there were some, some nervous letters to the editor, shall we say, being sent to Henry as a result of this, this article. In October 1960, however, Henry went forth with his piece and suggested provocatively that no elite Christian school yet existed. This is in 1960. Henry is a Wheaton alum. This is not a small claim to make in the Christian public square, right? I quote, it is not proposed to set up just another Christian college, but a university of the highest academic excellence. This need is not filled by existing institutions. <laughs> With full credit to those very few Christian colleges which enjoy the full and well-deserved respect of the world of secular higher education, the fact remains that such academic distinction is definitely the exception. What is looked for, then, is a university dedicated not only to the faith, but also to the highest and most rigorous academic standards, the university demanding the respect of the secular world of scholarship in the arts and sciences and in the professions. At the core, solid, dynamic Christian unity. In the branches, solid and creative scholarship." End quote. This was a bold statement to make in the Christian public square, as I said. And the editorial drew a mixed response. Some readers loved it. Others expressed concerns. Henry, at this point in time, was likely right in his assessment of Christian colleges and universities, still coming out of a, a fundamentalist era, uh, a Bible Institute era, though those schools did much good in their own way. So he was likely right, though this academic Jeremiah was largely unheard. The issue remained on the table for some months until prospective founders of Crusade University met again in November 1960. Those in attendance included Billy Graham, once again the host, Ronald Dahl of NYU, Enoch Dernis of Wheaton College, Lars Granberg of Hope College, Harry Jellema, philosopher from Calvin, Harold Lenzel, Dean then of Fuller Theological Seminary, and Calvin Linton, Dean of Columbian College, now George Washington University. So this was a, an impressive gathering. Henry presided over the meeting. Graham is host. Henry uh, led it. Once again, discussion waxed hot on one topic, behavioral standards. It is clear from the minutes, and they are lengthy, as I said, that nothing so drove conversation as student morality. The following, I want to give you a, a selection from these notes. Uh, that allows you to see the diversity of opinion uh, in the room. So the question is, we don't know who raised this question, but why single out particular items for moral condemnation? For example, drinking, smoking, gambling. This is the topic being debated, okay? Linton says this, it is easy to condemn others for devices for which we have no taste ourselves, but what of gluttony, intellectual laziness, lovelessness? So he seems to be on the left in this discussion, okay? Jellema pipes up. In our Christian reform circles, reading the Sunday papers is looked upon with disapproval. Okay? Graham pipes up. In some places in Europe, we asked crusade workers to forego the use of lipstick because it was regarded as worldly. Graham would seem to be on the right. Some Nazarenes object to jewelry for the same reason. Such prejudices are often parochial and not universally shared moral judgments. I don't know who said that. That person would seem to be on the left. A man named Singer pipes up, quoting Machen, when a group forbids what God's, God allows, its next step is to allow what God forbids. So that's also on the left. 
This material, I'm done quoting, is only a small swatch of this broader fabric. Clearly, the discussion drew heated opinions on both sides. That much is obvious, even from this brief selection. And Graham and Henry, if you read the, the broader material, very much attempt to toe the line, right? They're trying to bring people to the table. Graham leans toward the right, as I said, the more conservative side, and Henry to the left. That's not to say that Henry's unconcerned morally, but in terms of standards, he's for a, a more relaxed, less defined code. Graham for a more defined code. Now, it makes some sense why this topic so occupied the committee. To not have such a behavioral guide would seem liberal or progressive to Christians of this era. A and let's not miss this. Many schools in this period had collapsed morally, had lost their Christian foundation, and had long since departed from any, any Christian moral standard, let alone a Christian theological standard. So there is real concern, and speaking from my own vantage point, justified concern over moral standards. The school could be lost, could be swept away by laxness. Um, the, the committee broke without resolution, suffice it to say. Different players returned to their ministries, vantage points all pondering the prospects and perils of Crusade University. Henry uh, is largely quiet about the matter for two years, but he, his seems to be a disappointed silence, which perhaps we could understand. In September 1962, two years later, he writes to Dr. S.H. Mullen and surveys what has happened in the two years hence. Quote, about two years ago, a meeting was held in New York of key businessmen and some evangelical educators in the subject of the university. And uh, this matter was discussed for a full day, including finances. As a matter of fact, I think it was longer ago than that. The moving force was the fact that some 20,000 people, young people of college age, made personal commitments to Christ during the Madison Square Garden crusade of Billy Graham, and they were now, as it were, to be thrown to the wolves so far as their collegiate learning was concerned, inasmuch as there was no Christian college in the New York area that had full accreditation." End quote. Henry is alluding here to the 1957 Graham Crusade, which swept New York City, took it by storm, and uh, which reportedly drew many thousands of young people to Christian faith. Graham had apparently noticed this. These, I'm, I'm sure he and his team had these many young people flocking uh, down the, the trail to, to make a profession of faith, and he saw that there was no Christian college in New York City. But again, unlike Fuller, Christianity Today, other ventures, this university project had faltered. And the problems with the establishment of Crusade University were not limited to those suggested by Henry. The school in this 1950s and, and early 1960s period that we're presently in all throughout, it had trouble enlisting help from major donors like Bolton, John Bolton in Boston, who, as I said, financed many of Ockengay's projects, um, and J. Howard Pugh, whose money drove efforts like Grove City College and Christianity Today. Many of the most wealthy evangelical backers had long-standing ties with other schools. Garth Rizel, historian at Gordon-Conwell, Theological Seminary has shown that though Bolton initially had interest in this project, he eventually backed out due to a concern that secular schools uh, would lose what little evangelical student presence they already had. So there are many and varied challenges to the establishment of this project in some. But Henry doggedly continued his quest. This was not merely a vocational sojourn for Henry. It was existential. It was a part of Henry's being. For year after year, he responded to detractors, attempted to rally leading evangelicals, and presented his pitch yet again to potential donors. In a letter to Alan R. Bell of the Glen Mead Trust Company in April, uh, August 1965, excuse me, he laid out the possibilities of such a school, once again, observing that, quote, for 10 years and more, 
Some of us have been contemplating the possibility of a great Christian university located near one of America's major cities, accessible to a major airport and nearby facilities of a large, prestigious, secular campus." End quote. Henry then suggested to Mr. Mead possible donations that could reverse this trend. First, the school could use eh, $25 million for a campus, a liberal arts college and graduate schools of education, theology, creative arts and philosophy. Or, if 25 mil was too much, 10 million would suffice for a, quote, Christian Institute of Advanced Studies that Henry saw as being the eventual core, the, the core of a eventual Christian university. Henry did not receive this funding from Meade or from anyone else uh, on, on this magnitude, that is. But in a few years, he did indeed begin just such an institute. The Institute for Advanced Christian Studies, as it was known upon its incorporation in March 1967, sought to enunciate the Christian worldview in order to contain the secular tide that engulfs contemporary culture, as Henry described it in his autobiography. The project began promisingly with directors from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Indiana University, and the University of Illinois. Henry was also an inaugural director and the engine behind IFAX until it was shuttered in 2002. IFAX is largely forgotten today among evangelicals. Most evangelicals don't know it ever existed. But it filled a definite gap in its time. Over the years, grant recipients included Samuel Moffat, who wrote a two-volume work on the history of Christianity in Asia that very much anticipated the later explosion of academic interest in the Asian church that's growing even today as an academic field. The Henry Center has been crucially involved in that in the years past, conference in Hong Kong and Japan. Nicholas Walterstorff uh, wrote for IFAX, an IFAX-funded grant, on a Christian philosophy of art. Ron Sider worked on a text, I'm not sure it was completed, on the resurrection of Christ in light of modern historical methodology. Uh, these books were published with major publishers, Orbis, Orbis, and Erdman's from the three that I just quoted. And there are others that we could mention that were published as well. So for a historian, these things matter, even if, even if these are forgotten. These are actual, meaningful, on-the-ground contributions. Directors of IFAX over the years included historian Nathan Hatch, philosopher Ron Nash, philosopher Keith Yandel. In his autobiography, Henry noted that IFAX over the years had funded 24 of 57 applications for project funding and the median grant, this is impressive, the median grant was $6,000. It's a generous sum from an outside organization funding academic scholarship as uh, some of us in this room know. So as of March 1967, IFAX had begun. Henry had a project that he could drive, and indeed he did drive it. But the quest for a great Christian research university continued. It did not die as a goal for him, even into the 1980s. So now he's in his late 60s and 70s. For example, Henry was asked to give a presentation in June 1983 at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. All these uh, meetings and presentations seem to be in Washington, D.C. I don't know why exactly. Um, and, uh, and Henry, in this presentation, did not hold back on the subject. He, uh, he, he remembered how evangelicals, essentially in the, in the previous 25 years, had missed a window in his view. And I quote, 25 years ago, American evangelicals missed an opportunity to plant a Christian university in a major metropolitan area, a liberal arts campus with graduate schools of theology, medicine, history, philosophy of science, literature, and the arts, the whole spectrum. For $10 a piece, we could have done it. There are over 30 million adult evangelicals in the United States, but we didn't, and we have paid a high price. And here he waxes somewhat poetic. This is a beautiful section. 
Secular humanism continues to snipe at the supernatural to undermine God's revealed truth in his moral commands. We have good evangelical colleges, even some universities in the making, but we haven't fully phased modern secular culture with the Christian worldview. I keep hoping and praying that someday evangelicals will do it as it deserves to be done. Let there be scientists who behold God's glory in nature and not only in personal processes. Let there be anthropologists who affirm the image of God in man and not only in animal ancestry. Philosophers who stress that fear of God is the beginning of wisdom rather than the beginning of mythology. Moralists, ethicists, who emphasize God's commandments rather than the tolerances of modern culture. He was prescient, wasn't he? Artists who set agape to music and poetry and who will capture our now wicked world of words for whatever is good and godly. Let us have intellectual leaders who offer life and hope to civilization that has missed the way and needs to be alerted again to the incomparable greatness and grace of Jesus Christ." End quote. Henry's elegant and passionate prose makes clear that his dream had suffered a hard fate. It is not too much to say that the elite Christian university was a major preoccupation of Henry's adult life. Of course, let's not miss this, he worked on many projects, publishing over 30 books and more articles and reviews than one can count. In fact, the bibliography of all of Carl Henry's writings totals 30,000 words, the length of a book. Don't miss that. He also published the landmark six-volume work, God, Revelation, and Authority, held professorships of one kind at multiple evangelical schools, often at the same time, and lectured all over the world. On a level reached by no other neo-evangelical except for Graham and Ockengay, Henry was an evangelical statesman. He was a man whose grand hopes could yield impressive results or bitter disappointments. Fellow scholar and neo-evangelical Kenneth Conser, founding dean of this school, Trinity, offered such a perspective when he reflected in Christianity Today on Henry's career um, in 1993. Conser, who had himself given his lifeblood to establish this school at which we are at today, said the following. Perhaps the idea for a great university was ill-advised. Augustine taught us a millennium and a half ago that Christianity is best understood, not high in an ivory tower, but in the roaring thoroughfares of real life. In the radical pluralism of the modern world, a thousand rays of light may penetrate better than a single beam from a lighthouse." End quote. The point is worth considering, as is the way the pursuit of a university by Henry and others sheds light on the paradoxical nature of the new evangelicals. The same qualities, think about these things with me, the same qualities that brought them together could also hinder their efforts. Their associations were not binding. They struggled in places to find common doctrinal, and in the case of Crusade University, moral ground. So they wanted to get together, they wanted to work together, but th their instinct to come together was in some cases hindered by their diversity, unity and diversity, a, a tricky thing to strike unless you are the Holy Trinity. The plethora of existing institutions that the statesmen entrepreneurs created, which was a major sign of movement vitality, also made it difficult to squeeze in the one project that might have offered a transformative academic presence in America. They're, they're from all these different schools, and many of these schools are struggling and need all the donors they can get and all the heavy hitters academically they could find. So to pull together a major school would have taken a lot of those figures from their institution, sapping them of their own vitality. So we must not miss the ironic nature of Crusade University. The project, to put it plainly, didn't succeed. So everything I've been talking about didn't succeed didn't happen. I'm talking about a historical non-entity, ultimately. But the push for such a momentous institution tells us something. 
it signaled and signals that something unusual, dare I say inspiring, was afoot in the neo-evangelical era. Henry and others moved away from an isolated, defeated mentality and embraced, as we will hear in the last session, a bold, restless, ambitious vision for the future of their movement. This meant founding new institutions like CT, ETS, Fuller Theological Seminary, the National Association of Evangelicals, all successes from the start. And by the way, all still going, some in a slightly different theological form, but all still going. Those institutions are all alive. That says something 60, 70 years later. All this effort also meant trying to start other projects like Crusade University and failing. So there's another ironic note, however, that we have to mention to all this that we're discussing. Us, you and me, we are here at TED's, a premier neo-evangelical institution founded, in a certain sense, to be the new Fuller, seeking in our ways to advance the life of the mind within evangelicalism. That's what this conference is about. And to embolden fellow believers to advance boldly into the centers of culture to announce once more that the great God of the ages reigns and rules. Recent decades have seen a number of major Christian schools attempt to make the jump, to bridge the gap, to transform themselves from college or smaller university to large-scale, nationally impactful institution. Often these schools have been led by figures who knew or were influenced by Henry. Baylor University famously traveled this course under statesman Robert Sloan until various elements derailed the project, which came as a major disappointment to many onlookers, including myself, due to the promise of Sloan's grand vision. Sloan is now building a similar program on a smaller scale at Houston Baptist University. Union University in Tennessee has ramped up its efforts considerably under President David Dockery, who has drawn talented faculty members like Micah Watson, Ben Mitchell, Hunter Baker, and many others. Schools like Gordon College under new President D. Michael Lindsay, or Wheaton College under President Philip Riken, Grove City College, and others continue to provide strong academic training for young evangelicals. The most exciting recent prospect, King's College in Lower Manhattan, is led by Gregory Thornberry and is in the business of establishing a serious evangelical institutional presence in New York. Many of us are eager to see what comes out of King's in coming days. This is just a fraction of what we could say about the broader movement today of intellectually inclined evangelicalism. Something happened. Something happened as a result of the neo-evangelicals, as a result of Henry, ironically, though his vision failed. Wrapping up here rapidly, why though have we not yet succeeded as a movement in building a great Christian research university? Is it really that hard? Is it impossible for us to pull off? Does the vision not speak for itself? Surely it would require massive fundraising from Christians who already give generously to the promotion of the gospel of Christ's kingdom through missions and evangelism. That might be the rub, because that can be a tough sell. We evangelicals generally want to see a very high evangelistic return on our dollar. I'm just speaking historically and sociologically here. A university takes years to build. But let's think for just a moment about what might have happened if Henry and Graham and their peers had succeeded in this vision. Let's say that their hopes had been met in 1960. How many top flight PhDs would have graduated in the last 50 years? How many more books, in, in addition to those that have been published by a intellectually strong evangelicalism, how many more books would have been published that would contribute to the cultural discussion. What might be the output of several elite centers located at such a university that would answer key economic, historical, philosophical, sociological questions of the day? Why is it that Catholics are the only ones who can pull these sorts of things off? Why can't evangelicals? I don't understand. What 
what would such a school mean to evangelicalism? If grounded in a strong confessional statement and abiding by it, is it possible to allege that this might have meant a great deal? So let it be said then, by me at least, Henry was right. His goal was frustrated, yes, but he was right. <laughs> the university would have proved of tremendous value. Now, of course, there are many reasons why it never happened. It is tough, as I said, to pull donors. It's tough to pull top faculty members out of secular schools into a Christian school. It's hard to sell evangelicals on long-term projects not directly related to missions, though we must never put the life of the mind and the gospel work into conflict. I, I in no way want to do that. I want to bring them together as Henry did in his own person. My favorite Henry anecdote is his students at Fuller talking about how he would come into class on Saturday morning exhausted because he was out the night before evangelizing on the streets of LA, evangelizing homeless people. And when I read that in Marsden's Reforming uh, Fundamentalism, that, that took my appreciation of Henry to, new, to a new level. He, he put his doctrine to work. That matters to me. And of course, the rather tricky matter of who would run the school is vexing. We have to point out, of course, that secular schools don't play nice and don't make it easy for us to establish schools. It feels today, furthermore, like confessionalism is passe and denominations are outmoded. But let me sound, in conclusion, a different chord. I wonder today if we are in what might be a golden age of confessionalism. In other words, our challenge in a secularizing culture might just be our opportunity. I'm not meaning numerically. I don't know that as evangelicals, confessional evangelicals, we're going to see huge booming numbers. But I do think in, in terms of vitality that we might see, we might see a thick doctrinal identity uh, emerge and survive and perhaps even thrive in our day. The neo-evangelicals, for their part, were long on cultural vision, but a bit short when it came to confessional identity. This is one reason why crusade never took shape and form. But Carl Henry, nonetheless, pressed on with his goal throughout all of his life. And we are right, we are right, to find in his example inspiration. It is true that the local church deserves our primary attention and energy. But, as intellectually minded Christians, are we right to talk ourselves out of grand and ambitious projects because they seem hard? Do we subscribe to a kind of spiritual pragmatism when it comes to funding priorities? An ironic pair, I admit. Is it possible that in coming days, we might establish an institution that could be a major aid to the cause of our local churches? A school like Calvin's Academy, the Puritan's Oxbridge, Mather's Harvard, Edwards's Yale, Kuiper's Free University? What kind of last irony would it be if a project like Crusade University, a failure and forgotten, inspired us, the people of God, to seek such a lofty goal? In evangelicalism, after all, failure of even the most abject kind is not failure should providence steward it. This is true whether we are speaking of our own spiritual lives, crusade university, or the cross that refigured the universe and recreated you and me. Thank you.